All right, cool. Well, anyway, everybody, welcome. I um, appreciate everybody here on a Thursday evening, uh, the Carolina Multifamily Connection. Uh, this is a forum for out-of-state investors to connect with boots on the ground operators and other investors in the Carolinas and wherever. Uh, we Everyone here looks at multiple markets. And again, this is an opportunity for us uh, to connect, network, learn, and discuss. Uh, today's topic is on build to rent. I think it's a very topical uh, topic, uh, particularly right now in the interest rate environment that we are in, as um, you know, many renters find purchasing a home a little more difficult than it was six, seven months ago uh, when rates were at two, three percent. Right, so um, it creates an opportunity uh, for for um, for those who are out there uh, purchasing uh, and building, and you know, there's there's a rent there's a base out there of rentals who are looking for newer product and an opportunity uh, to learn more about it. So I'm happy to introduce you guys to Andy uh, McMullen. Uh, Andy is a fund manager at Legacy Acquisitions, which is focused on partnering with world-class operators while delivering white glove service to its investors. Andy values a strong standing personal relationship with brokers, operators, institutional lenders, and private equity firms real estate transaction over a 20-year career. Andy graduated from UCS and is on the board of advisors for a number of top flight companies equation. And now they were not searching for deals in the home in San Diego with his wife and three kids. Thanks. Uh, welcome. That's good. Yeah, man. I, I feel like every time I hear that, it's like, oh, such a bore. No one cares. But um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna live it up a little bit. Maybe throw in a couple of lies here or something like that, whatever gets people interested, you know? Um, is, this when so, Jeff, yeah, is this when Kevin jumps in with the rah-rah? Yeah, yeah. So Kevin, like usually what he does right about now is he starts with push-ups. Like, so he'll start push-ups and then just start counting them out. And then you'll hear him kind of groan. It gets everybody boosted, you know? Let's um, get it going, baby. Let's get it going. Let's go. Woo! Up and up. So, uh, up and up. Budding Irish. That's great. We know you got it in you. Yeah, yeah. We know you're from the left coast. So, uh, yeah, Irish Irish come come out to uh, the left coast sometimes. and uh, I see Amin and over here doing some pull-ups. Yeah, he shows me how to do it. There we go. Um, yeah, so no, you know, you know, Jerry, my story is that I kind of, I don't know, for those older, I kind of magooed my way into real estate. I was coming out of college. You know, all my friends were kind of, uh, you know, paper millionaires going into tech companies here, there. And I just had a buddy who had said, hey, look, I've got uh, this project in LA. He was kind of um, an intern at this boutique real estate firm, and they were buying a bunch of buildings, mostly office, some industrial um they had their own brokerage they had their own property management and so when i got in there i just kind of wow these guys some of them might even be a little bit dumber than i am uh and they're doing fantastic things right and uh i always tell my team if that's like the one gift i can give you in as we're going through these transactions is look if an idiot like me can do it then you guys can can do it so probably about five years or so in the brokerage game um and then my mentor, you know, he had been kind of guiding me a little bit towards more of the investment side. And I started to see some of these checks that would come across his desk, you know, that were deals that I had never even heard about, right? That he was just a passive investor, you know, that at the time, you know, Fund 7, Irwindale, whatever it was. And he had these kind of just cash flow checks coming in. Um, and so for about, I don't know, maybe five years or so, I kind of struggled in just learning the game of development. Um catching fees, kind of being low man, negotiating a lot of the kind of, you know, CalPERS and CalSTRS and, I, you know, some of the larger, you know, banks that were out there. So really route through 2006, 2007. And then, um, you know, obviously everybody knows what happens in 2008. So we were on the development. We were sitting on a nice project in Venice, uh, California. Um, and most people don't think about how long it kind of took to get back to where we were. So in other words, we just kind of, teetered along from 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. It really kind of started to come back in 2012, but it still really wasn't there. And uh, it was about then we started just kind of buying more multifamily projects, a lot in the central California area, Southern California area, and then started looking more um, as the market started to evolve a little bit, you know, looking more in the built to rent space. And so that's kind of what I thought I'd talk to you guys a little bit about because I, we still like multifamily. We bought uh, probably about a thousand units or so last year in the multifamily space. Um, but I think with the 
rates where they are and kind of where the the I would say more tastes are kind of evolving. This built to rent makes a lot of sense. So um, I'll let it breed there, Jerry. I'm sure you got some questions. By the way, we've got a lot of resources. If you guys are curious more about some of the stuff that we'll talk about today on LegacyAcquisitions.com, uh, we've got a lot of you know all the lead mags you could think of the the book the you know the the guide the playbook the habit tracker all that stuff on you know yield of cost all that stuff that we can talk about today but um you know that and i hope this could if jerry permits i hope this could be kind of an open forum where you guys feel free to ask questions and um engage so that's so, all i got jerry uh, is that about all you need me for yeah <laughs> yeah now we can just get the drinks going and start the Let's party. go right? <laughs> so wh why don't we start, I guess, with a, just a basic definition of, of, of how do you define build to rent? Yeah. So, I mean, build to rent has been going on for a while. Um, if you guys remember in 2008, a lot of the Wall Street money that kind of the same Wall Street dudes that kind of destroyed by, you know, setting up these these uh, these crazy loans that we had and default swaps, et cetera. The same guys that are now buying real estate, you know, 40 cents on the dollar. So they basically pick an area let's say part of Carolina, maybe let's just go like Winston-Salem and because we bought some stuff there. And so they would go to Winston-Salem. They basically buy all of the houses that they could possibly buy in scattered sites, right? They basically buy, you know, 40, 50, few hundred together. And then they try to figure out how to manage, it, right? Well, as they figured out, that was really difficult to do, even if you have areas in the same kind of region. So at one point, you know, Genius said, hey, why don't we just build these next to each other, manage them? We have a huge, huge supply issue, right? We haven't been building for 12, 15 years. Let's just build 12 to 2,000 square foot homes with the big backyards and the amenities and manage them like multifamily. So pulled apart multifamily, horizontal multifamily, you can call it whatever you want. The same idea is managed the, the same way. So that's kind of what we started doing in mostly the Southeast because we felt like in the Southeast, as you guys know, on this call, you can, you can still get land relatively inexpensively. You've got, you know, municipalities that are developer friendly. They're willing to help get you there. You can talk to the mayor. You can meet with the city council members, San Diego, the projects that we do now in the South would take me, you know, five years to get done. Yeah, and I think that's why you know the fact that you you know, you you now you're building these all together. So I think in some ways it's a complement to multifamily, right? It, it could be townhouses, it could be single family. What type of forms uh, do you have? Um, obviously, high rises. Like you know, what what type of uh, product in general could be built to rent? Yeah, so um, it does vary. Um, I would say anything from a kind of simple, you know, concrete slab stick build, you know. We've got our, our project in Lafayette, Louisiana, for instance, is about 100 homes, all in that kind of 1,200 foot range. They cost us about 180000 per unit to build. We'll have a dog park, walking trails, um, you know, a playground. But really all what most people care about is do they have their doggy door and their backyard, right? That's kind of that's kind of what people in this the young families that are in the South, they want to be next to good schools. They want to be next to, you know, relatively uh, amenitized communities that they've got and they don't want to pay an arm and a leg. So, you know, our, those projects, those are 1200 feet, you know, maybe 30 foot yards and, you know, we can get about 1700 a month for those. Now in some other areas, we're building two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms, some townhomes in like a 250 unit community with a clubhouse, with a pool, and then all the additional amenities. So it kind of depends on that market. I would say where we start is what is the topography like? Like, can we clear the land relatively easily? Can we work with the, the county and city? Are they, are they amenable to, you know, discussing iterations, et cetera? And then are they next to good schools? And we see in job growth come in, you know, um, population growth, all the kind of, you know, greatest hits that you guys hear about. One thing that I think we look at maybe a little different is 
where is the crime kind of dipping? Because those ultimately where will be where people are coming to, right? So those are the kinds of things that we look for. So it does vary a little bit on the the um, the build type, whether it's kind of luxury or you know um, B plus. You know, they're all new new product with new technology, etc. But they do kind of vary as to you know the type of build that we create. Excellent. So they can be horizontal apartments, duplexes. Yeah, we don't we don't really do so. We do do two stories. We're, we're working on a two story project in it's an area called Broussard, and we might have a couple of two stories in um, Foley, Alabama. We're working on some in Austin where we have kind of like you know three units in the townhomes cluster. You know, with, you know, so it'd be like a two hundred unit project, but you might have a, a portion of that. You know, that's that's clustered. So, um, you know, that one of the other things that we really consider is like, what would be an ultimate exit strategy? At what point in the development process would we have an opportunity to either get out if we needed to, to refinance if we needed to, to sell to an institution if we needed to, or in some cases, even just create an HOA and sell them off in groups of 10, 20, 30 to smaller mom and pops. So... Yeah. So that's the portion actually that has got me interested. Um, you know, that part of it purchasing. So not the building, you know, you're taking the construction risk out of the equation, but as a potential buyer coming in and buying it, you know, obviously some, you know, there's some discount to it and then renting it from there. Yeah. I mean, I think, so if you, I don't know, maybe it's boring, but, but I'll just go through it. It might be helpful to some people on this call. So the process that we usually undertake, it's just pretty simple. So we'll go, let's just say, you know, tomorrow we found a, a site in in uh, Austin. Uh, Austin's kind of a market. You got to go really to some of the outer markets of Austin, right? You know, San Marcos is a good example. Let's just say we found something there. Um, in most of the markets, we would option the land first, right? So Rather, in some markets, they won't let it. You get closer to Austin, Phoenix, some of the larger markets, you couldn't option the land. You got to buy it outright, and then you got to, you know, just hope that you can get it entitled. So what we do is a little bit, we option it first. So let's say that's ten to $50,000, depending on whatever that area is, whatever market is. Six months or four or five months where we go through all of the entitlement process. When I say entitlement process, really what I'm referring to is can you get the city council, the whoever is in charge, the neighborhood council, county, all, everybody in favor of your project exactly how you're going to build it? So number of units, elevations, common areas, how does it relate to tie-ins for the city? So all of that's approved before we even we, we even decide to buy. Then we'll do go through the purchase process at that point. Figure about another two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars for engineering, environmental, right? Because we wouldn't want to do that, put all that money invested before we know that we can get approved. So that takes another, let's just say, five months or so. After that's done, now what we're called shovel ready. So when you guys hear that term shovel ready, that just means now we can build infrastructure. We can go streets roads, utilities, tie-ins, all that stuff that we need to kind of create the community. That's usually about six to nine months. And then we go to what we call the vertical construction, which as you guys would know it, you know, unit unit build out. So that's where you would have most of your building costs, right? You could be building, you know, you got all your interiors and exteriors, et cetera. And obviously in development, you guys know the speed with which you build is the most important thing to your um your bottom line and your investors bottom line so that's kind of the the process so to answer your question jerry if at any point in time we decided hey we've created a lot of value from the transition of the infrastructure to the vertical build you know that would you know take out a lot of your risk right because you know now you've got this this property that's got this new valuation all the entitlements all of the horizontal infrastructure is done if you decided at some point you needed to you could sell that land for a gain so that's kind of what i try to tell people is yes there's risk in development there's risk in almost any real estate deal we would argue that there's probably less risk in these 
bottom-up deals than there are many of the multifamily deals that you're seeing in the B and C markets where their rate cap is just right around the corner and you've got almost a negative leverage situation coming where you've got your interest rates at the 6 7% range, maybe in the 8% range at the rate cap, but your cap rate is also creeping up too, right? So that's part of the reason we feel like in the built to rent space, we can control a lot of that margin that is a little bit less predictable in the multifamily space. So does anyone have any questions out there? I know we have some land people in here. Uh, and Zawa, you're one. Um, I, uh, I'll leave the uh, open for some questions before we move on. Don't hey, you Andy. Con contradict me. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Um, so <clears throat> I have some questions for you because I'm doing something similar now where, uh, where we're um, breaking this out into, as you know, there's the first phase of it is purchasing the property, entitling the property. And once you get it entitled, you're now ready to be shovels in the ground to start construction. So we have, you know, you have the, the, the land purchase portion. Also, you have the, the, the fees that you have to start paying out to architects, engineers, geotechs, or all those professionals that start adding up after a while. So that's like our first raise right there. And then we either have a couple of different exit strategies, like you mentioned, how do you guys break out your raises and how does that work exactly when you're raising money for each of these different phases? If you are going from like raw land all the way to final construction. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I wish there was one answer because we we structured deals a little bit different. But if I can kind of just to give you an example, which is usually helpful, um, we actually we go through the entitlement process, but I but I would not pay the engineering and the environmental until I'd actually closed on the property. So I would wait. So I'd go through the hearings, make sure the project is approved, go through the preliminary, you know, approval, go through the phase one, all that stuff. So minimal costs up front. So let's just say whatever that number is, less than a hundred thousand and less than 50. And then once we close, we know that we've got the mayor on our side, et cetera, city council. I think our last project, there was one cantankerous, Dude, that you know, so we were six out of seven guys. Um, so yeah, at that point, now we know we can go ahead and spend the two hundred thousand dollars to do the engineering environmental. So that's another kind of five months or so before we're shovel ready. So what you're asking really is, how do you raise for that? So what we would typically do is, and Tony on our team who has got a lot of development experience. I think he's on the call too. I might bring him up at some point. But um, right here. good to see you, buddy. Yeah, Tony, Tony, Tony's been in this game for a long time and uh, definitely somebody you guys should definitely reach out to. Um, so, so in, in our case, what we would do is, investor, we've already eliminated all the risk or all the risk, a lot of the risk in the entitlement phase, right? M much of your kind of risk is, is decreased in the entitlement phase. How about this? We'll give you a safe agreement which basically is 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 a simple agreement um, first entry. So basically, early money coming in. So we'll give you a twenty percent return, right? That basically you get accrued for the entire time from when we buy the land through the entitlement. I mean, through the engineering environmental phase and through the horizontal phase. Right now, so that's basically you've got uh, maybe that's twelve months or so, twelve to fifteen months, right? Where you're basically got a fifteen, a twenty percent. Everybody on the call probably says, "Oh, that seems like a lot," but in a development deal, if we're paying out, you know, internal rate of return that are twenty five or thirty percent, that's probably a little bit even less expensive than that, right? So at that point, let's say Gonzalo on month eighteen. Now you're ready to go out to the market. You want to go out, do the 506C. You want to create a PPM. Now you basically got all the capital that you needed to get to the vertical start. So you've gone through the engineering environmental and the horizontal. Now you've got the vertical start. Now that person, let's say they put in 100 grand, by coming in a year early, they've basically got their money in 
So now it's worth 120 to 130,000, depending on how long we keep their money. And that's their new start point via the PPM. So that's the way that we did it, where people are saying, hey, I'll put in, you know, I'll put in $100,000. Sounds like you guys have stripped away some of the risk already. Um, and now that becomes my new valuation. And I'll keep it. Now, the, the spirit of the agreement is that you would keep your money. You're in, you're in the deal, but you're in a new deal at a new valuation. So that's that's one way we do it. And and I know that there's probably a lot of the questions, so I'll keep it short, Jerry. But the other way we could do it is raise as one PPM early on and basically start paying out accrued returns from when they got in, which I think is a lot more expensive. We've also done it where we split up the loan in from the horizontal. We'll get a horizontal loan that's separate from the vertical loan. So we'll pay out all those investors on the horizontal side. Those people that want to stay in to the vertical can stay in. Those people that want to get out can get out. Most people obviously, you know, have created quite a bit of value in that in that amount of space that they like the idea of, of staying in. So we can talk more about it if there's more questions or maybe when uh, you get on one one on one with us, Gonzalo. I'd love to hear about your projects as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and by the way, our timeline is much shorter here in South Carolina, like half. Yeah, that that's and, and Tony's in in <clears throat> uh, has some stuff in South Carolina, and we're looking in South Carolina. We like South Carolina a lot. Are you Greenville? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm a Greenville man. guy. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's so, so anyways, that, that's that's kind of how we're, we're looking you. at them. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So just I guess before we move on, so if you if you bifurcate between a vertical and a horizontal, are you doing three uh, raises, like the first phase being the funding of the law and the land, and then you're paying out the investors that are that came in at the vertical at the horizontal, and then yeah, I mean, ideally we'd like them in the safe agreement. They, the spirit is that they stay in through okay. vertical they just have a new mark so they came in a year earlier now they got their 25 percent. all that money was accrued now that's their new basis right um but there there are some scenarios where if and we've been able to do that in the past now that's part of us buying up their shares and that we never make this guarantee and i would definitely not encourage anybody to make that in their ppm but if there are people you know the other the other option gonzalo is you know, just take a take a loan from those people, pay them out a pretty healthy return, fifteen percent just through the horizontal phase. You pay them out with the new money raised for the vertical, and you know now they're out of the deal. We could get into tons of different ways about it, but we've also talked about the convertible note, where basically that you pay them out your fifteen percent, and they've got the option at that point to get their money out in their loan payback or roll that into the project at whatever the terms that you're offering, you know, to answer your question, Jerry. Yes. Let me, um, anyone else out there that want to jump in of any questions? Hey Andy, this is Richard Hall in Austin. I really appreciate you uh, sharing. Yeah. uh, Thank you, Richard. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. We got something working in Austin, so we'll be reaching out. Sounds exciting, although, uh, like you said, Austin's uh, probably an area to focus on, but not the city itself. <laughs> uh, and thanks and, you know, for I sharing. Thought, go, go ahead, and then I'll, I'll give you a little tidbit after uh, just reading about it today. Sure. Yeah, thanks for sharing uh, the ideas on exit strategy. I think that's always important, and certainly seeing distinctions between the, the build for sale versus build to rent. There's quite a bit of nuance or differences, and and it gives you a lot more uh, kind of room to play. And I think with the build to rent provided, you know, you set it up that gives you that exit strategy, whether it's for sale individually uh, with an HOA established or uh, whether you go with more of institutional or even grouping to smaller investors with groups of homes. But I was wondering, what's the current lending environment? I know most lenders are pretty pulled back on construction or land loans, particularly uh, with all the national home builders really pretty much trying to get out of uh, contracts or uh, uh, having a lot of fallout with their buyers. So I'm just wondering what the lending environment is. And then the second question, if I might throw it in there separately is, are you seeing much with 
production housing or things that are uh, not uh, site built but factory built or any technologies that you're liking or maybe interested in yeah absolutely i'll answer the second question first if i could because uh, the tony i think is going out tomorrow to uh meet with a couple of uh of um i, I guess i guess we call them factory built but but really honestly we've probably interviewed half a dozen and a lot of them did not have you know a lot of that together so when you're kind of considering how we can speed up really it's it, the cost is not much difference but the speed with which we can build right is so much quicker right because if they're manufactured now we can we can deliver that a lot a lot quicker um so yes we are i think uh tony where is that is that in south carolina you're gonna be tomorrow yeah we're going to greenwood south carolina so greenwood. so what it is is it's a, a technology that i'm sure most of you have heard of it's modular but there's different levels of modular building um a lot of it is from the city from the city and county side they see it kind of as mobile home but the the real modular players that are doing really good work are on par or better with, than stick build homes they're just done as andy said in a more timely manner um and they build them off site and then they just transport them and assemble them on site greenwood is about what 45 minutes south of greenville yeah, it's about 45 minutes southwest of Greenville. So, okay. And there's some there's some industry out there too, I believe, right? There is. There's actually a lot of development going on there. Um, I actually <sighs> met with a broker today who is doing a townhome development down there. So it's growing over there. Yeah, the other thing, and I'll, I'll get into lending, lending too, Richard, but the other thing, Jerry, that I'm fascinated um, with in North Carolina is – and maybe you guys can speak to this a little bit later if there's time. Is there's a lot of these kind of secondary and tertiary markets that were always kind of on a septic system. The cities now have kind of put in quite a bit of money on the infrastructure to bring a lot of these cities now or, or these counties, areas, I should say regions with now infrastructure and plumbing. It's changed sewer, et cetera. Um, and it seems like there's probably some of those areas that are kind of in the path of progress which really haven't hit those higher levels in land cost but do have some 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 help from the city as far as some of the infrastructure so those that's an, that's part of the reason we like north carolina is we, we think there's probably a pretty decent opportunity there um, yeah, andy on that note um one important thing to, to check as you know is uh, just making sure the capacity is there when you're bringing a project online that's one of the first thing you should check out especially uh building around some of these towns you talk about because the wastewater treatment plants that typically is owned by the county sometimes the city is like at capacity so bringing in another big project mm -hmm. is they're going to require you to, to dump a ton of money into uh, expansion of these things uh, interesting so okay so you have check. You, you have you have heard about this oh interesting all right cool yeah so lucky for us in uh, lancaster county for the time being there's enough capacity for what we're looking in but uh, there's a couple of projects ahead of us that this is why we're trying to get all our paperwork in early is that if we wait any longer they're going to start requiring developers now to put in um an upgrade fee for the wastewater treatment plant there so uh, it's gonna you know something to check out yeah no that's good um okay richard yes yeah, so you asked about the lending um so just kind of as an example i basically signed docs so anybody that's ever been uh, in, through a loan process they know that you get the notary out they come to your place and you're signing on the docs and all the guarantees etc in this particular case it was a it was a um, non-recourse but the next day the docs came in i got a call from the bank probably the largest debt fund in the world. Some of you guys probably know it. And they said, hey, look, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, Goldman Sachs and all our warehouse lines, they're not going to, they're they're not going to be able to purchase up these loans. So we're going to have to keep this on our books. We're okay with keeping it on our books, except you're going to have to drop your LTC, you know, about another 500, you know, basis points. So, um, so in that particular case, you know, we, we obviously had to raise more. There's some a safety net, I guess, if you consider that the investors are a little bit lower on the stack, but it certainly kind of gives you an idea of how 
kind of calamitous this market is. Um, there's definitely, I've seen a precipitous drop off in the the amount of lending going to, you know, some of the bridge, some of the land that we've seen. Um, I, I, you know, I read something really good today just about, I think it was in Forbes, just the, there's a lot of people on the sidelines, but they're really kind of right about the sidelines, right? Because right now, as an example, there's lenders that are kind of, or, or there's builders that are kind of pulling back, right? So maybe there's some of those projects, they'll turn some of it into built to rent. Some of it, they're just going to, you know, hold off on building <clears throat> until things kind of come back to normal. But what that means for built to rent, which I, we would have never really considered at the time was this affordability gap that just keeps growing and growing, right? We, we knew that there was, you know, I don't know what the number is, but say a couple million. I think it's almost um, 3.5 3. or 3.8 million. Pardon? I'm sorry, what was that for? The, you're talking about the shortage of, of, of homes, right? Uh, well, the shortage of homes, yeah. I mean, we're, I've heard anywhere between two and a half to two and a half million to four. But what I'm saying is like the amount of money per month per household that was basically decided, hey, look, I'm going to put my money in a mortgage or I'm going to put my money in rent. And now that delta is about $800 per month and it keeps growing. And in some markets, it keeps growing even more. Like if you were to take Austin, for example, I bet you, Richard, month over month on rent in that market is probably dropped a little bit. Year to year, it's probably up. But I I imagine in, in, in Austin, because there's just so much there, you know, you go on a mile and a half stretch, you have you know, six, seven built to rent projects, right? But in the rest of the country, there's this huge affordability gap. So if I'm going to be paying 3,500 for a mortgage, but I only have to pay 2,500 or 2,700 for the rent, but I know that the mortgage is going to be an old house where I got to fix a bunch of stuff. The new one is all the new tech and I can get my air conditioning turned on from the car and I've got a backyard and my doggy door and walking trails, et cetera. And I've got a bunch of neighbors they don't have that same old stigma that they did living one renter in a community of, of owners. That's a much different animal. So that's part of the reason that most of the projections for built to rent, maybe it'll start to regulate down a little bit. You won't see that eight to 10% growth in rents. And certainly nobody should be underwriting to that, but you might see a little dip regulate down in 23, but 24 and 25 <laughs> as this affordability gap continues to grow not just that, but the same, you know, as you said, 2.5 to 5 million units. And when you think about, it, we only built 500,000 last year, we only built 200,000 single family rentals last year. So there's a huge five year, maybe seven year run here for people that are really looking to kind of invest in what's the, what's the trend that makes sense in a down market as opposed to, and an up market. Um, so anyways. So, so anyway, so to, so to answer your question, Rich, we, Richard, we've done, you know, a loan for the entire thing. Well, I'll just give you terms. 75% uh, um, loan to cost, a uh, rate cap that probably makes sense at a nine and a half, if you consider just on bridge stuff, if you're building, you know, just the infrastructure, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have basically a, the spread of maybe five and maybe so for 300 or 400. So you got to kind of consider that maybe you buy that rate cap in that range. Um, you know, I would say if we're underwriting stuff that's three, four years out, we're trying to make sure that all of our projects can support that higher interest rate all the way through. Uh, I think most banks will give you credit for on a stabilized basis, somewhere in that five and a half to 6% interest rate that that would be kind of, in two to three years where that stabilized, you know, Fannie Freddie rate would be. Um, in one case, we do go, you know, I think community banks would be a much better bet for people to look at now based on the fact that, you know, you can still get stuff in that six, seven range um, and the fees are a lot less. So it does, it does kind of run the gamut. I, my, my feeling on it, I've had a, we have got a partner in Andrew G who founded um, Mag Capital and has been in the game probably about as long as I have. His thing is like, I remember what it was like 2008 where you couldn't get a bank to do a single thing and just like the water just shut off for everybody. 
this is if you can get capital and you can kind of get to the next play and you're in the built to rent space, I think you've got a lot, you know, certainly as much as you can control it, fixed debt is obviously ideal. But if not, then get long term rate caps where you know that it makes sense throughout your underwriting. Excellent. Oh my gosh. I see everybody snoring. Come on. <laughs> Kevin. Where's Kevin? Kevin, where's <laughs> all right. Uh speaking about here? speaking about going build to rent and speed, Andy, I'm gonna ask you five questions. I want you to give me an answer in one minute. Oh no, so this is basically where he tells me I'm meandering again. Okay, go ahead. Okay, ready? Okay, no, obviously here's the big fact is in as far as cost and risk, right? I, okay. By the way, did you get Jerry's approval for you hosting the show? I mean, I don't know if he gave you a code. Did you co-sign on this, Jerry? Well, I, I, I said I'd send him a. I said I, I told him I sent him a boil of Bailey's. Oh, and, oh uh, yeah. Anyway, okay. hold on. Let me take a little drink in. Yeah, go ahead. Wet my whistle. Time for that. All right. Um, now this is uh, questions regarding cost to risk as far yeah. as. Location being one, how much is the cost per acre, the cost to build per square foot, um, supply chain issues that drags out yeah. the development, and contractor builder labor. Yeah. Can you answer all those in a minute? I can. All right. So let me let me just give you something really quick, which is I, there's a paper that we wrote on it, so I won't go into the details. But as many investors are transitioning or even kind of diversifying with multifamily and development development you really need to look at what is the yield on cost much more important than the irr and the reason why is if i'm putting in a certain amount of money into a project two million uh for you know the land let's say another 10 million for the for or another uh let's just say eight million just to make it round numbers for the infrastructure etc i want to make sure that i've got a yield on cost the total amount of money I put in and divide that by the NOI. So whatever that stabilized money that I've got, my, my net income that's coming in, can it support a yield on cost that's above six and a half to seven? We, we try to be above 7%. And the reason that's important is for what Kevin just alluded to is cap rates are coming up. Supply chain issues still have not necessarily been ironed out. You could have some labor increases, although our experience, just anecdotally, Kevin, is labor's come down, concrete's up, lumber's down. Um, concrete's maybe only really 10% or so because it's just on the foundation side, so that's not that big of a deal. But what's a big deal is if you can't get the appliances in and you can get all of those units built, but you can't get them stabilized, right? You can get them built, but you can't get them rented because you can't get everything finished on the interiors, you know, that's a big problem. So, um, so I think I answered that. I would say I was out in Lafayette, uh, just got back last late last night, you know, um, really, really competitive uh, labor market now, a lot more calls because of what you just alluded to earlier, that builders are not building as frequently, right? And a lot of guys are just holding off on projects. So we're getting a lot more competitive pricing on the labor market. Um, lumber's come down probably about two times from what we had, what we underwrote our project for. The rents have gone up, you know, from 1500 where we underwrote it to 17, you know, on average, let's just say a few hundred bucks um, if they're a larger project. So I think all of those, those fundamentals are, 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 are sound, but, but again, like, Historically, you'd have a, a contingency of maybe 5%, right? A 5% contingency, that's a pretty good number. Most banks are going to underwrite at that. You know, historically, you'd have interest reserves below the line. Now the banks want to see that above the line. What I mean is they want to see that above where the net income is taken out. So if your valuation is based on your net income, they want to see those reserves above the line. Um so, you know, there's a lot of things like that that still concern me. I don't think we're out of the woods, but do I think it's the least best invest? Is it the least worst investment? Definitely. What were, when we, maybe I missed one or two. What were, read through your list real quick. Well, I think it was, um, you know, mostly, you know, just the cost like per acre as far as like, obviously. Oh, yeah. So that's obviously location is going to have a big thing 
to do with the cost per acre and how far out you're going to be from the city you know where do the tenants have to go to get to work if they're not you know remote things like that you know so obviously cost per acre is going to be your huge initial um cost so yeah so i'm just doing the, the latest deal that we did it was about 64 grand um it was about 1.8 million about 28 acres um we can build about 240 units it's going to cost us probably about 175 to build all in so maybe we get up to 180 um i'm talking about per per unit right so for every market's a little bit different when you consider like the density how many of those units can you build per acre right so for the areas that we look at in the southeast we want to see anywhere between eight to ten units per acre right that's kind of where we want to be now you could go into some of these larger markets you get maybe like three cluster townhomes something like that maybe you can get a little bit better density more per per acre but that's about where we need to be and um you know as a result that that's a pretty large margin the other thing that most people know but but maybe maybe it has it's kind of missed a lot of investors is the amount of money that you're putting in for operating expenses on these b and c multifamily projects are got to be 45 to 55 right on the bill to rent most of those operational costs are in that 29 to 33 percent range right so you just imagine the amount of margin and, and why because it's new stuff right it's new stuff stickier tenants meaning they stay longer um and so that's like another reason why you could probably have a little bit more baked into the cake of of margin that you can you can you know benefit from all right give jerry back his show kevin thank you <laughs> thanks now that that's great good stuff no i open it up for um calls but i guess before we do it is kind of like impact you know what we've been talking about here um uh, you know it seems you have the opportunity for higher returns because there's this added rest risk of development right um the ability to have a product in the market that you know you're may not otherwise be able to have but you, you know you're building uh, and the current renter who that spread is growing between the cost of, of renting and the cost of buying but they can go into this product and still get new stuff so that's a, that's going to be something that's out there right now very topical and then from the you your perspective there's also multiple exit strategies which allow you to navigate through circumstances in the market yeah i mean i think if you if you'll probably notice it, it's kind of like a you know like a car you're looking to buy you notice that everyone has one when you get back on the road um you'll start to see now with built to rent kind of headlines as to what why people are putting their money wall street's put in it's still kind of the favorite son and the reason is because it's very hard to find yield anywhere else so calpers calsters pension funds they want to have that yield and like i said before the yield makes sense in the fact that you've got the rents that are going up and the affordability gap that's going up. So that's kind of a nice straight, you know, yield for them. And then if they do expect that cap rates, et cetera, will kind of settle down, then you also could benefit from the appreciation, right? Which we don't put in our underwriting. It's all based on income. But for those funds, that's part of the reason that they like it. So when we're looking at a market, we want to know down the street that we've got a DR Horton or DSLD some kind of institutional group that's basically invested in that region so that it's a little bit easier for us to sell if we need to. Hey, Andy, um, I'm glad you touched on appreciation. So I got a question because uh, the um, the type of property that you guys are building, which is the, um, what do you call them again? The, um, they just, oh, stick, a stick you know, like a concrete slab, stick build. Now everyone has a little bit yeah, some of them are luxury packages packages some are a little bit more standard packages but yeah just a a pretty traditional kind of concrete um you know um siding but it's concrete board siding but it's pretty pretty simple build in fact our lafayette project is almost all of them have the same layout three two bedroom 1214 i think it's 1200 square feet just different elevations so the the outside of the places look different, but that does speed up our build time. But yeah, how's the um, how's the appreciation on like modular homes versus you know traditional build? 
in regards to appreciation because there's obviously there's a difference there. Uh, yeah. How do you put that into the numbers? Although when you think about it, Jeff, I think there is like it's it's offset to a certain degree. If, if you're building something, especially in the southeast, there's going to be natural weathering, you know, from the time that you actually start a build to finish a build. The modular homes, you you put it up, right? So you basically you don't have any if the kind of weathering, you don't have any of the rotting. Um, but but yeah, I mean it would be an interesting kind of survey. And I don't know that we'd have enough data yet, Tony. To support whether there's a huge difference in the amount of you know appreciation from a naturally stick built home to a modular build to the investor by the time i mean there's really not a whole lot of difference in the materials it's almost just a, a difference in the way that it's assembled tony anything you want to say yeah, about it um it's a great question uh, a lot of that is going to come down to Number one, the location of the, the actual asset. Number two, the material and the structure itself. So it goes back to what I was saying before that a lot of a lot of cities and, and county jurisdictions, they kind of perceive modular as mobile homes or mm -hmm. that they're they're not on a slab or that they're not tied to the ground, anchored to the ground like a, like a typical house is. So the modular right. that we're talking about is essentially a stick built home. It's just as strong, if not stronger. It's made with studs. It's made with all premium finishes, and it's put on a lot of land, just like a stick build is. The only difference, really, is that it's transported by truck, and it's assembled on site instead of physically built on site with a bunch of contractors. Um, so to, to Andy's point, there's not really a lot of data that can support appreciation on that. And one reason for that is because we really shouldn't, we really shouldn't assume appreciation on anything. Um, right. We're blessed to have it, but we shouldn't assume it at all. But with the new modular technology, as I'm going to look at tomorrow coming out, I see appreciation running on par, if not above where stick build is at. For one reason is that it will, it will grab the appreciation hook a lot quicker. You know, if you think of a stick build home, it takes you 90 days to get one stick build home built in a good market where there's plenty of labor, plenty of material, everything, 90 days. When you can build a modular home in, say, 30 to 40 days, well, it's grabbing the appreciation hook a lot quicker. And then it's appreciating at the same rate that the stick build would. So I think that that's where we're going to see the market going. And there's also many different options to the build style that you're going to do. Um, last point that I'll say on that is that, you know, the, the group that we're going to look at tomorrow, they do modular builds all the way up to four, 4,500 square foot homes that are plantation style built in country clubs and on the lake. So it's not, it's not what the modular of yesterday was. The modular mm -hmm. technology is really growing. Um, and I think to your point, appreciation is going to grab that a lot quicker i'm curious jeff what 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 what's your what's your read on it maybe you know I, i'm not sure you know the question yeah you know, people, yeah i guess like, i guess the appreciation aspect um uh, maybe more of the value you know um so I'm, I'm here in the dmv area we also do fix and flips out here so a price for a modular home versus a you know traditional build there's a there's a price situation there that uh it's considered by appraisers here um, as well as by the sellers or I mean the buyers. So, you know, they'll, that's still a consideration in price point when it comes to those. I mean, I know you guys are doing uh, build to rent, but if your exit strategy is to sell later on down the road, is it going to be viewed as a, you know, um, you know, just like the, the bad term of, you know, mobile home modular type of stuff, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm making any sense here. No, that makes sense. I mean, look, I don't think, you know, for us, you know, we've had to in previous, you know, previous lives, I guess I should say, where we basically have a whole project that we've got to kind of condominiumize and sell off. We're not doing that. So it's almost all of it's based on whatever kind of income, again, like multifamily, right? What is whatever the, that income is. When you were asking, like, if we had to, you know, if we had to chop it down to five or 10 or singles is now, now is the value, you know, I think it is again with the data, maybe a little bit too early to tell, but I, but I'm curious to get, Get Tony's feedback when he gets back. Hey, I have um, a question for you guys. Hey, Marcus. Hey, how you doing, sir? 
Hey, it's either for you, Andy, or Tony. Which of the better module companies out there? I know you were speaking of some. Some are good, some are bad. I'm in the Northeast up here in New Jersey, and um, you know, I was really looking as as an option to build like our apartment building and things like that. How can you tell the better ones? On yeah, Tony, um, maybe if you leave your 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 info in the chat, it'd be helpful. Maybe Marcus can reach out after tomorrow and get you know get, you can give him your uh, sense. Yeah, of Marcus, I put the I put the inf my info, my email, and my phone number in the chat. If you uh, if you just ping me, send me a text really quick, I'll give you a call either tomorrow or Saturday morning and kind of tell you a little bit about it. But from a high level, from a high level with the relationship I have with Impressa Homes, which is a, a modular builder down here in the Carolinas, um, their, their entire mission was to be able to build stick build grade and even better, just being able to, I guess, manufacture ties, if that's a word. Uh, that system to be able to build it off site and then just transport it, but still have the same or better quality than a stick build. So I'll know more tomorrow uh, as I'm going to be down there and I'll relay back some information that I find. Um, but shoot me a text, shoot me an email and I'll touch base with you one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks Marcus. Seems like I may have found another topic to discuss on the modular homes. Um, yes. Yeah, Tony on. <laughs> yeah, uh, even um, I have a group that we've been looking at an Air Airbnb in Puerto Rico and um, oh, Amit's on this call. We actually found um, a module home, but then that we had to look into understanding the, you know, are these hurricane grade and can handle that type of uh, you know situation out there. But it seems to be an interesting topic for sure. Yeah, I will say the other thing, too, Joe, is we're not you know we don't want anything that's in a flood zone um we're really particular about that i would say that you know the most you know our partner on the ground has built probably 50 projects or so hammerhead and that might be an interesting follow-up too is get chris vaunt and tony on and talk a little bit about the acquisition side because that's a that's a whole nother kind of fun topic um but yeah usually what happens in these areas where we're investing is you know the power goes out and that's a pain in the ass because everything in the fridge spoils or maybe a shingle or two. We're trying to build these things really kind of condensely like mini tanks, right? So you just kind of got one, one kind of foundation wall. Everything is really tightly and it's taut. So um, that's a big part of what we're doing is we've got to be in areas where we don't have to worry about the, the flood zone. They got to have the high enough elevation to support that. I mean, obviously you never know, but, but that is kind of one of our, prerequisites so i know you're west coast and i usually you know cut off the presentation because you're at an hour um but if you want to take another question or two no no i'm, I'm good uh with whatever hey Arn, good to see you um whatever people want to ask um and i know you guys do some breakout rooms so i, I don't want to be pulling away people from that and i'm happy to sit in uh those as well excellent so i know uh twee had a question here in the chat um, wouldn't a module home be risky in terms of concentration in supplier, one supplier? On the next one available is in PA in California. We had looked at a project, the modular the multifamily ended up being about the same cost and not slightly more. Yeah. So now that would be an interesting conversation. Now, when you say cost, cost of materials, because when I consider cost, yeah, they're probably similar in cost. But if you can get those up in 30 to 40 days, as opposed to 90, then, you know, we're talking about a whole different holistic cost. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Is that, is that total cost with considering speed with which they were built or just the materials itself? Hmm. Uh, I hope it looks like she may have jumped off because I don't oh, see. Okay. So that'll be a follow up question. I'll find out a little bit more. Who, whose question was that? Um, tweak. Oh, tweet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. When it comes to modular, how many can you bang out at one time? Uh, from the discussions that I've had with Impressa Homes, they're able to get two, two delivered, which you can put two on a truck, essentially. Um, so you can get two delivered and have them done within a week or two. And, and that's just full assembly. So, you know, you're, you're thinking 
you could probably get one done in we'll just say five to six days, another one done, same amount of time. Um, so, so about the same where we were, we were kind of paced at six to 10 a month, bro. pretty much yeah. the same pace. Yeah. Yeah. And again, take my information. I'll know more tomorrow after a visit with Impressa because I'm going to be drilling down on these questions. Um, but again, that's six to because, that's six to ten starts right with the modular. It's coming in, it's yes. done, right? Yep. So that's where you yep. really kind of cut out a lot of the the, the fat. So six to ten modulars versus like how long for six to ten stick builds? Yeah, and I, I bet you could probably. I mean, in some markets, we're able to do closer to fifteen a month. So I, I imagine it's really just a matter of can you get the transport right? It's not it's not about the materials itself. It's really about how quickly the transportation is the biggest transportation is the biggest the biggest factor in modular um because say we have a project in austin um and it's coming from the greenwood facility that's the only one that services it so now this modular has to go across five states to get there so it's that's the that's the only that's the biggest factor that you have to think about when it comes to cost when it comes to speed of assembly modular is pretty much done in a factory um and then they they basically just put it together right there on site hook the utilities up and you're ready to go